This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is 101.9 High FM, the Finding Human program. This is Sue Jackson, and I'm connected to the studio with Wussy. It's so nice to see you this morning, Wussy. And I'm sitting with my guest, Dr. Andy DaCosta, and we're sitting in a beautiful kitchen, and we're going to be talking about very many things. Andy's Renee Brown said, one day you will tell your story of how you overcame what you went through, and it will be someone else's survival guide. And this is exactly what Andy and I are hoping to actually impart on these the series of podcasts that we're going to be doing. Andy is a medical doctor, and she specialized in postnatal depression. I met her quite a few years ago when she helped her daughter of mine who was suffering badly from depression, postnatal depression, and I was incredibly impressed with Andy. So to be back here sitting next to Andy today is an absolute privilege. Hello, Andy. Thank you for such a beautiful introduction. You're going to be talking about your journey to postnatal be specialising. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, that I should start with becoming a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, it was hilarious because I was in in grade 11 or 12, I don't remember, and one of my friends dared me to go for an interview. Not in a million years did I ever think I would get into medicine. And I thought, okay, I take on a day. I'm prepared to step out of my limitations, of which there are not. I refuse to be limited in capacity by mm. circumstances. So I decided, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And I went for my interview in Helper Hospital. And it was an amazing interview with the Dean of Medicine and three other professors. And it just flowed. And when I went downstairs to catch my bus from Hilbra back to home, one of the professors came downstairs and saw me. And he said to me, you are the only person that I'm going to be able to say this to. But I'm really looking forward to seeing you next year. I mean, can you imagine that just from my interview, I was given a place in medical school. So he obviously saw your soul there, your spirit. Yes, I think so. Uh And I've done a lot of political work and gone through the whole of Alexandra Township to put polio drops to every single child Hmm. in the township. I took off a block from surgery to do it. And then they always asked a lot of political questions. And I was very involved in the anti-apartheid days. So you seem to remember that you mentioned to me that you were actually, your home was raided a few times. Yes, my home was raided by the police three times. Mm. I mean, my diary is still sitting at John Forster Square. Oh, no. And it was never hard for me. Because I was living my purpose. And when you live your purpose and your right intention, I truly believe that it will work out no matter what the consequence. Mm. And I'm a person that lives with intention. And when that is congruent with my challenge, then it will be, it will flow and it will manifest itself. Can you mention just for a moment before we get back to that, your present challenge that we're sitting in your kitchen talking and um, which is beautiful. What do you feel your present challenge is? So my present challenge is multiple factors. I've been suffering from a severe neurological degenerative disease and I hate giving it a label Mm -hmm. because then it defines what it is and it makes me think of where I'm going. But I am under the umbrella of motor neurone disease and it's a devastating diagnosis. So 
the challenges of coming to terms with my new life, which is so different to what it was. From bungee jumping in the Victoria Falls Gorge <laughs> to zip lining across the Victoria Falls to taking on any single physical challenge. Mm. I was a gymmer, a runner, a doer. I was a butterfly in the world. And this disease has brought me to stillness. And so that is a huge lesson for me and a huge growth point. And it's something that I'm working on every single day. How long have you known about this diagnosis? If I look back, it's been five and a half years since my symptoms started. But this diagnosis was only made now in January. Oh, gosh, so so soon. So many diagnoses Mm -hmm. and very invasive treatments for a condition called stiff person syndrome, which is what Celine Dion has. I don't know if you know her. Mm -hmm. And I was in hospital for a week. We're going to get back to that shortly. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program, and I'm here with Dr. Andy DaCosta. Your maiden name was Tobe, wasn't it? Yes, Dr. Uh, Andy Tobe DaCosta, and she's telling us part of her story. But before we go on, I actually want to say something personally about Andy. When I, I actually spoke to her last week, and when I was speaking to her, she mentioned that one of her favorite books was A Woman Who Run With the Wolves. Well, when Andy says that she jumped from, you know, over Victoria Falls and Bridge and what have you, bungee jumping, I get the shivers. But then I look at Andy and I realize that's exactly who she is, a woman who runs with wolves. Wolves will never, you will never follow wolves. You'll run with them, Andy. And that's exactly what I'm hearing. So I'm going to let Andy go on. And we're going to go back, I think, if you would like to, to your medical school days because your whole journey has brought you to this place of unbelievable strength. Do you know that one of the women who run with the wolves, that Clarissa Pincola Estes, who wrote it, says, one of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in, in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. And that is exactly what you are doing. Thank you, Andy. You definitely are sharing your soul. So every morning I wake up and along the journey of getting dressed, I sing myself the song, Rise Up. It's the most beautiful song. Right, sing it a little bit for us. I can't remember. <laughs> we'll look at it. I just stay with Rise Up, Rise Up. Mm. You've got to rise up to your challenges. Mm. And so in medical school, when I, there were many limitations for me to be able to go to medical school, is that our family wasn't financially stable. There was no money at all. And I never got a bursary. I can't remember why. And it was going to be a tough journey. But again, I knew I was doing it. You were determined. I wasn't, mm. I'm not scared of doing difficult things. Mm. And I was absolutely determined. And so how I managed it was that I worked all the way through medical school. I taught maths. I waitressed every single weekend. I worked in the medical school library and I loved it all. I don't remember any of it being stressful. Hmm. I mean, I do remember finding my identical twin sister one night in Israel, and being overwrought and hysterical that I wasn't ready for an exam the next day. Mm. And So you've always been determined. I can feel it just sitting next to you. Your determination is is palpable. (laughs) And, you know, I lived in a commune, which is now called Dex, and I managed to pay for everything that I needed there. And I lived a very independent life. And that was one area 
that grew my resilience tremendously. I'm sure. And there have been many ways to grow my resilience in my life experience. And so medical school was fun. It was fabulous. And when I graduated, I owed a fortune of money to the medical school. And so I had to get a job that I could pay back all my loans. And lo and behold, I got a really hectic job, and that was to run the Mopar Casualty. Oh, my word, yeah? And On your own, I mean, with others, obviously, but mostly you were in charge. Oh, my gosh. And what was really my push to say yes was because I was always scared of how I would manage a car accident and stopping on the side of the road and all the casualty cases that would come in to the hospital. I was also not confident in my surgery abilities. So I thought, here I go. I'm going to put myself straight in there and learn these skills. Mm. And I assisted in surgery in the afternoons. I ran the casualty in the mornings. 24 hours a day available, Mm -hmm. and I really put myself in another challenging position. Incredibly, because it was a lot, and a lot of it was unknown. I mean, you didn't know who was going to come through the doors, certainly. I mean, one day a guy came in, and they had to bring the machinery with. His arm was caught, flattened by a printing machine. Oh, my word. Literally flattened. And we had to take the machine into theatre and try and repair his arm. I mean, it was like a carpentry lesson. So crazy things came in. And that was a great learning curve. I'm sure, because you never gave up at all. You, You carried on. And as you say, it was not only what came into casualty, but what went further than casualty into the doctors, the surgeons. Yes, yes. And coping with family members. Yes, and creating this lovely camaraderie with all the doctors and radiologists. It was fabulous. And you just, I wanted to ask, when people came in and you were dealing with their families, what did you bring out in order to bring a sense of calm into that situation? Of course, anyone who enters casualty, even if it's just a fever, is at their wit's end of what to do. They've come after waiting and waiting of whether it's warranted, it doesn't warrant it. They come with fear, with absolute immobilizing fear. And my task, which I was born to do, was to listen to listen and hear their fear Mm. and to say we will do everything in our power to assist you. And in situations, I would categorically be able to say, this is not serious, darling. We are going to do this. You are going to be 100% fine. People need to be listened. Mm. They need to be heard. They're different words, Absolutely. And, you know, nowadays, so often you hear that you go into a doctor, a specialist, uh, whether it's at a chemist to go in for a nursing sister, for, and you are rushed through. You're not heard. And I think not being heard causes far more anxiety. Oh, it's awful. And especially when whoever it is, a wife, a child, a grandparent, what, whoever it is, gets worked away into an examination room and you are left in the waiting room with no knowledge. Mm -hmm. My policy was to send a nursing sister out every 10 to 15 minutes to give the family an update. Mm -hmm. They sit there in Mm -hmm. utter, utter fear. Absolutely. That must have been comforting to know that someone was coming out. Mm, Absolutely. I mean, it was different when recently my husband came off his bicycle and he was unconscious and I had to get to casualty and saw him in this like brace and battered and fractured shoulder. Oh, Oh my gosh, thank God I was a doctor. 
because I could be in there with them. Oh, uh, you were allowed so in. So wow. it was a reason I found <laughs> I get good parking and I could be there with them. But it was terrifying being the on the one, other side. Being on the other side, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is what I live with now. I'm on the other side of doctoring. I'm the patient. One thing I think I have learned from you in the last week, we have been in contact with each other, Andy, and she has, Andy and I, and she has told me very definitely what she doesn't want to talk about, what she does want to talk about. And so she definitely is not someone that you're going to push over. So I cannot imagine going into a doctor's room without your own questions and insisting on being heard. But can I tell you something? Mm -hmm. In our present medical availability in South Africa, you need to write your own story. Mm. My doctors are phenomenal. But when you are in the hospital, if I'm not taking care of my medication, my doses, my timing, of when to have them, so much goes wrong mm. and so much would, would go wrong. I mean, I've been in hospital 17 times. Oh, my gosh. And we're going to get back to that. Thank you, Bussy. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Okay, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program on 101.9 High FM. I'm sitting with Dr. Andy Tobe de Costa, and we are discussing her journey at the moment with motor neuron disease and how she is has taken control of her own, I would say, your own treatment, really, because what you're explaining to me here, what Andy's just been explaining, has been how you today, in South Africa especially, you have to take control of your own medication. What You have to talk about your own needs when you're in a hospital situation. And being a medical person myself, that's something that worries me terribly. When I do go into hospital, when I've got to accompany someone into hospital, there is that huge fear of thinking, what am I handing them over to? So it's a life lesson for everybody. And when I work in postnatal depression and perinatal care, so that before the birth of a baby, I go through with my patients for two hours preparation for how to manage hospital, to walk them through being admitted mm. to going into their season. Mm. But the most important message is listen to your intuition. Don't wait scream and shout if you think something's going wrong Mm. because I've had many patients who didn't scream and shout and had obstructed births and gave birth to children Mm. with cerebral palsy. Oh, my gosh. You have got to listen to your intuition. Do not be scared to shout and scream if you feel a niggle. That's fantastic. Uh, actually, Andy, just listening to you saying that and you saying it with force, very good idea. Do you want to go back a bit to how you got involved with um, postnatal depression? Sure. So after working at the Mopar Casualty and paying back my loans and being free and having a car, I went to work in Alexander Township which were fabulous years. So I worked there in the mornings, and in the afternoon I joined a very busy GP practice in Gala Manor, which I adored. It was a high turnover practice, but it was fabulous working with my colleagues, and I still miss that practice. But what took me away was an experience in my husband and my lives is that our first pregnancy with our beloved son, Tevia, which means the goodness of God, Mm. was very complicated. And I spent the last six weeks of my pregnancy in hospital. It was extremely traumatic and a feeling of desperately being out of control Mm. of what the outcome was going to be. And devastatingly, 
he passed away at eight days old. Oh. Mm-hmm. And it was an experience that still sits in my soul and in my DNA. And mm-hmm. it was a beautiful experience because he was in ICU, sedated completely. And I whispered in his ear, my darling, don't stay for mommy and daddy. Oh. Take your own journey. You will manage and you will manage. Oh. And you do what you need to do. So he came in here to spend that eight, those eight days with you and your husband. And mm. to complete that cycle what he needed. of life. Mm. But and amazing life. that you recognized that and oh. were able to say that. Was it an intuitive knowing? It was. I often do this, and you've worked in hospice, and it's a given permission that we will manage mm-hmm. if you leave us. Mm-hmm. And once you give a patient permission, they often can let you. Don't know if you they de- definitely have experienced that so often. Yes. And so. And it's a privilege to experience it. Oh, it's such a privilege. And. Because people clutch onto life and at a cost of severe suffering. Mm -hmm. And what happened was about half an hour after that, I was holding my baby's hand and suddenly I saw this and felt this unbelievable movement in his body. And he was completely sedated and this shaking in his chest. And I suddenly saw this golden light leave, coming forcefully out of his chest, mm. flying into the universe. And I knew it was his Moshoma leaving. Oh, my word. And it was such a comforting feeling. And then slowly, slowly, his pulse started dropping. Mm. His oxygen saturation started going down. And he was passing away. Oh. And mm. So I, you accompany his soul. Right to that last moment on earth that he was able to go. Wow. That's so lovely to say that. That makes me very tearful, actually, Andy, the thought that you were able to to be with him and allow his neshoma and that he allowed you to see his neshoma. And Ellen and I were parents for the first time. I mean, we were a mommy and a daddy. And were you able to hold him once you... After he passed mm-hmm. away, when they removed all the machinery, they gave our beautiful son to us to mm-hmm. hold together. And we said vidu uh, and oh. shma, and we gave him blessing after blessing. The interesting thing was that I was scared to see him change color mm-hmm. and actually scared to see him properly do it, you know. And so I passed him out to my mom. So she didn't mind at all. She was a remarkable woman. And I let him pass away in her hands Mm -hmm. so that my memory could be of his beautiful skin Mm -hmm. and touch. And then came with the support of my mom, Ella, and my beautiful sisters, Cheryl and Linda, my primitive howling like an animal. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. You know, it's amazing that you actually mm-hmm. mentioned that because just yesterday I was reading a story about a wild goose and it's written and he says he just wanted to, to scream and yell in rage and pain and hurt. And he went down and he saw this wild goose and the wild goose was screaming in the pain that he was feeling. So actually, I will send you that story. I I read it yesterday and I thought, gosh, can understand that absolute anguish. I mean, what synchronicity is this? Mm. And it was just like an exorcising Mm. of my utter grief and pain. And it's a primitive animalistic sign Mm. that one will seldom experience in life. And... We had beautiful support in the waiting room outside the ICU with so many people saying to him, so this was another experience of growing resilience. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned to me, well, I know because you saw one of my daughters, I definitely know your skills 
in postnatal um, and depression especially. Did you do this in, in honour of your son? That's exactly it. So I had to go and take myself into a place where I did not let the suffering go to waste. I had to leave my magnificent practice. It was a calling. And to open my own practice mm. in my beautiful Tevye's name and to elevate his neshama. And that's when I started working alone and developing my practice in, in people losing children. So that's how it was for the first year. And then Aria was born, our second son. And that's when I experienced severe postnatal anxiety. I'm sure the fear must have been overwhelming at times. Uh, actually, my fear of losing mm, him, mm. but it was a real postnatal anxiety. And I just want to say as an aside that the postnatal depression is part of what it can be, but there's different ways that it presents. It can present as depression, it can present as anxiety. It is there it can are can present as anger. Absolutely. Mm. And a deep, deep feeling that this isn't my child. This can't be my child. I'm sure it belongs to someone mm. else. So almost disbelief. Yeah. Mm. So on that spectrum, mine was severe anxiety. And how did you get through that? My twin sister was an unbelievable. Does she live in Johannesburg? In Cape Town. Oh. And she understood this. Oh. And she carried me. Gosh. The other thing that is so important in life was to have structure. I could not be alone with my baby. I was obsessed with him. I didn't want anyone to take him from me, but I needed a bodyguard. So there it's, was that fear of yourself and of what might happen? No, no, not just a feeling of I can't be alone. Oh. And just knowing that there was someone with me mm. and mm. I had a structure and a roster of who was coming and mm. what hour, mm. and that protected me and it protects me now in my present condition. You know, you mentioned when I spoke to you on the phone that you have this shadow side and um, did it start then, that, that fear of the unknown? So. Don't we all have that? Oh, very lives? definitely. But when you've gone through an experience like you went through with Tevia, the resilience definitely came in very strongly for you and your intuition, intuition as well. But do you feel that sometimes that fear lingers at the back of us when we've gone through something? So one thing it did do for me is that there is not a day in my life that I do not appreciate my three boys. We're going to get back to that. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on High FM, 101.9 High FM. And um, I'm on the Finding Human program. And my guest today is Dr. Andy Tote de Costa. We're sitting in her kitchen and we're on Zoom to the studio with Busi, and he's keeping us on air. And um, this is another section of that Andy and I are going to be discussing. We're sort of doing that almost like a series of talks. And if you'd like to listen to them, please pick up the podcast on High FM, um, Finding Human Podcast. Andy um, is a specialist in postnatal depression, and she was telling me and us about her journey to choosing this speciality, which was in honor of her baby boy who passed away. But in order to hear that full story, you'll need to go on and listen to our previous one. Andy, can we discuss for a moment, you were telling me about your sons and how when you had boys, your first son, you were very anxious yes. with him. And just to go back one step, mm -hmm. after we lost Teddy, in relationships, that can take you, your husband and wife, in opposite directions because nobody grieves in the same way. And so Alan and I made a 
very conscious, verbal decision that we were going to unite over this, no matter how different our grief was and how different we expressed it. We were going to make this, make our relationship stronger. And then we got the wisest words from Rabbi Famous of Blessed Memory. And he said to us, you have buried a child. Don't bury yourself. Oh, live. Gosh. Live life. You are here to live. You will not be disloyal to your child. He wants you to live. That's amazing because going back to our previous uh, podcast, you spoke about giving Tevia, your little boy, permission to leave. And you said to him, Daddy and I will go on. Your dad and I will go on. And here the rabbi was almost saying the exact same thing to you, saying to to you in honor of of Octavia, go on living. Wow. That's amazing. And so my three boys, our three boys, Arie, David, and Rafi, are our lives. We appreciate them amidst the chaos of family arguments and crazy behavior. We are a team and we have a family where we have built open communication, dedicated time. Shabbos is the greatest gift there mm. can be mm. because we are here and we talk. That's wonderful. And our children are totally in touch with everything. Mm. There was a time where I wanted to hide what was going on with me. Will you just mention again what what has been going on with you? So what began as me tripping, going out of shore yeah. five years ago on Rosh hands. I tripped on my right leg and tore my gorgeous dress. That's all I was worried about. And I didn't think anything of it. Then came Sukkot and I tripped again. And going upstairs or going upstairs mm-hmm. to another beautiful dream. And, <laughs> and then and you still didn't think anything of it. I didn't really. No, I'm a clumsy clot, <laughs> you know. So an excellent doctor, but a clumsy clot, so that oh. doesn't go together. <laughs> so uh, we then were held up on a Friday night with guns to our head. Uh. And one of the guys put a gun to my back. It said run, and I couldn't run. Mm. Then I knew mm. I was in trouble. Good heavens. I couldn't What run. a way to actually realize that you were in trouble. It was devastating. And for the children to see it. Oh, were they with you? Yeah. Oh. Mm. And I couldn't hide what was going on. Mm-hmm. But I still didn't go to see a doctor. So what saved you in that situation from being shot? Well, what do you think saved you? Do you know, I was so lucid in the moment that when I saw them driving up and jumping out of the car, I took my expensive watch off my hand and dropped it into the bush behind me that it wouldn't be stolen. I was completely lucid. I am very good in crisis. So I managed it in such a calm way. It wasn't traumatic for me. Mm. It was totally traumatic for my children in mm. Helen. But, but you kept your head about it. I, you know, on that, I'll just tell you something similar that happened to me. I was with one of my daughters and we were at a, a supermarket when we were held up and we had to lie on the floor. And I took my uh, engagement ring off and hid it behind the cereal box. That is so <laughs> clever as well. Uh, I mean, the, thing, the things we think about in a really traumatic yeah. situation, yeah. it's quite amazing how that part stays. No, I don't either. Yeah, but that's because you've worked it. Mm. Mm. And so you've built that resilience muscle. Now, you know, you were talking about your twin sister, and your husband and your your sons and how they have helped sister. you through. And I wanted to ask you about your other sister. Um, Where does she live? So she lives like 10 minutes away from me. I call her my ICU. She is my intensive care unit. She is a remarkable woman. She lives in my pain mm-hmm. and in my distress. 
and so does my other sister and so does my family and friends. Mom. But Cheryl is right here. She works very hard. But wherever she is free, we are together and that's when I feel so safe. And I've got either any of these support systems mm-hmm. next to me, I feel so safe. And that is the concept you were teaching me about the word caress. It's a beautiful word, caress, K-R-A-S-S. It comes from a book um, that was written by Bono, uh, I can't remember his surname, Bono Gart, I think. And it talks about a, a connection of people around us uh, with a spiritual connection. And these are people who often follow us through life, but sometimes can enter our lives at certain times and we have an unbelievable connection to them. So that's what um, Andy's talking about. So I have the most blessed caress of soul, family, and friends, and this extends into my cousins and into my aunt and my dad and his wife in America. We're going to get back to the caress in a minute. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. And, uh, I'm with my guest today is Dr. Andy Tobe de Costa, a medical doctor who is a GP and she specialized in postnatal depression. And she's helped hundreds of women, including my own daughter. And that's how I met her. And Andy said one of her favorite books is Women Who Run With The Wolves by Carissa Picola Este. And really, I am sitting in Andy's kitchen in her home beautiful kitchen, beautiful woman sitting next to me. And we are connecting through her stories. And I'm just so privileged to be part of hearing her story. Sorry, Andy, I picked your the caress. The caress. Let's just tell people what a caress is. So a caress is a group of people that surround you, that you are deeply so connected to and have a deep understanding of each other. It is such a gentle, beautiful word that really sums up what I live with. And that caress, as I say, starts with my husband and my children and my sisters and my extended family and then my remarkable, remarkable friends. Have they been friends for a long time? friends for years and years. A real caress. A real caress. I mean, I have a birthday party every year and they are only for my closest caress of friends and it's at least 25 people. Wow, I don't know many people who can say that 25 people in their circle of friends. Or my soulmates. And I can call on my sister or my family or my friends at any moment, and one of them will be here. But Andy, that doesn't just happen. What do you bring to friendship and relationships, your family relationships? I bring, what do I bring? Yeah, she's smiling at me here with this beautiful smile, and I'm asking her a question, and she's not sure how to answer it. Well, I think I bring love, right? deep love and understanding and listening and humor. And deep connection, a deep soul connection. I think I've brought out feelings that people have never, ever noticed Mm. in themselves. I don't have superficial relationships. You're authentic. My kids say, Mommy, you dive in. It's like too soon. But I have authentic, (laughs) real relationships. Mm, I can get that. And I think I bring... I must bring something else. (laughs) I can't answer you. But what you've just said to me is something incredibly personal in a relationship. You said laughter. But with that laughter, you also allow tears. And I think that is so much part of an authentic, deep relationship is to be able to laugh. And sometimes that laughter turns into tears. But you can still Stay next to each other in that pain or that humor. And so yesterday, I was sitting in my kitchen with three friends having lunch. And they said, you're so amazing to share. Well, I said to them, 
they don't share anything. And maybe I'm the fool that shares everything. <laughs> and we just laugh. That's wonderful. And you are going to have to wrap up now. I'm getting a message from Vusi. Vusi, thank you so much for keeping us on air. Thank you so much, Andy, for sharing this part of your journey with me. We are certainly going to be doing other series. Andy's got a lot to share, and um, and I, I just so enjoy sitting here next to her. Thank you very much. Just all of you take care, and Andy's just going to leave with a message. Don't be scared. We've all got to rise up. Everyone has to rise up every single day. Don't be scared to live your best life and trust and listen to who you were born to be. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. And thank you, Bussy. God bless. And to everyone listening in, thank you so much for being with us. Bye.